When we're looking at the probability of more than one event or two events taking place, it can sometimes be a lot easier to understand what's going on if you make a table or a grid. So we're going to have a look at a couple of examples, one table, one grid, so we can see how we can organise our thoughts and how we can calculate the probability of two events taking place. Um, so in our first example, um, we'll look at, uh, let's look at ice cream, cheer us up. So let's say, for example, there are three flavours of ice cream. Let's say we could have um, chocolate, we could have um, strawberry, and we could have um, a vanilla. Okay, so there's three types of three types of, of uh, ice cream, and two people are going to are going to choose their ice cream. So let's say we'll have Sally, and we'll have Tom. So Sally and Tom are going to the ice cream shop and they want to choose an ice cream each um, and there's three flavours to choose from. And we might be asked the question, what's the probability of them both choosing chocolate? Or we might be asked the probability of what's the chance of them both choosing the same? We don't know which one it is. So it's quite difficult to look at that information and work out what the answer is. But if you make a grid, then it can make things a lot easier. And equally on an exam question, you might be asked to fill out a grid to show all the different possibilities of things taking place. Now the key when you're answering a question like this is to be organised in the way in which you think. So, two events, Sally's going to choose and Tom's going to choose. So I'm going to make a table showing what they might choose. And I'm going to, I'm going to work through in a logical order so I don't miss any ideas. So, for example, Sally might choose chalk. And if she chooses chalk, then Tom might choose chocolate as well. Now I'm going to, I'm going to fix one of these. I'm going to stay with chocolate for Sally. So she might still choose chocolate, but Tom might choose strawberry. So I'm going to cycle through the options for Tom while I keep Sally's the same. So Sally might choose chalk. And this time, Tom might choose vanilla. Okay, so that's sort of one possible outcome. Then I'm going to cycle Sally's round, so then Sally might actually choose strawberry. So if Sally chooses strawberry, Tom might still choose chocolate. If Sally chooses strawberry, Tom might choose strawberry. And if Sally chooses strawberry, Tom might choose vanilla. So that's my second group of answers. And then finally, Sally might choose vanilla. And again, I'm going to cycle Tom through the three options that he might choose. So I know that I've chosen, that, that I've identified all the possible outcomes that could take place when Sally and Tom go in for ice cream. And so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible, possible outcomes. And so we know from those nine possible outcomes but that's the bottom of my formula. So if you remember that the probability of something taking place, so the probability of an event taking place was the, was the number of times that that event can take place over the total number of events. Okay, so if now my question was, what's the probability of both people choosing chocolate? Well, how many ways can both people choose chocolate? There's only one way they can both choose chocolate. What's the po total possible outcomes? There's nine. So the probability of them both choosing chocolate is one out of nine. And I could change that into a decimal or a percentage if I needed to. Equally, if we were asked the question, what's the probability of them choosing exactly the same ice cream? Well, they might both choose chocolate, but they might both choose strawberry, or they might both choose vanilla. So there's three ways in which they can do choose the same ice cream and there's still nine ways in total. So the probability is three over nine and you are expected to then take that to its lowest terms so the answer would be there's a third. In the second example we're going to do two, uh, one person is going to carry out two things so I could say I'm going to roll a dice and I'm going to flip a coin. 
So again, two things taking place. A bit difficult to work out. Uh, I have a picture in my head of what's going on, but this time I'm going to use a grid rather than a table. I could use a table. I could go through all the different combinations like I did with the last example, but uh, I just wanted to show you a different method. So with a grid, we put all of the possible outcomes of one of the events along the top of the grid and the possible outcomes of the other event down the side of the grid. So if I was to roll a dice, I could roll a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. If I was to flip a coin, I could flip a head or I could flip a tail. And by making a grid, you can see all the possible outcomes, or the combination of all the possible outcomes. So I could roll a 1 and flip a head. I could roll a 1 and flip a tail. I could roll a 4 and flip a head or a tail. And so I can very quickly see that there are 12 possible outcomes. So I already know there's 12 possible outcomes. So if I say, what's the probability of um, rolling a five and flipping a head? Five and head. Okay, so a five and a head, that's the only way I can roll a five and flip a head. So that's a probability of one over total number of probabilities, 12. So the, pro the probability of rolling a five and flipping a head would be one over 12. If I wanted to know what the probability of rolling an even number and a tail, then I could do a two and a tail, a four and a tail, and a six and a tail. So there's three ways in which I could do that, and again, out of the total number of 12. And I'm expected to take this to its lowest terms, so that would be a quarter, 0 0.25, 25%.